Okay, um, what I was asked to do was to put something together around um, sort of my Arsenal journey um, and things that we went through and experienced and the reasons why we were successful and trying to put that down. And actually writing out the presentation was quite interesting to go through everything that we had been through over the last sort of four seasons. So I'm just going to start with a, like a brief background around Arsenal ladies. Um, the club itself has become probably the most well-known women's football club in the world, um, in the brand that it, it builds. Um, and that's definitely because of its success. Um, over 40 trophies in 35 years. And the major part of that is the fact that the men's team has backed them, backed the club all the way, um, from financial support to use of facilities to being in the house within the training centre where the men train, to have our offices there um, and to pretty much be completely integrated within the club has been a major part as to why the club, the ladies' side of the club has been so successful. As it stands, the budget that the men provide on a yearly basis is £500,000 um, and that pretty much funds players, players' wages, staff um, and, like I say, facilities, etc. pretty much come for free. So um, that's been a major part of it. A major reason why the men's relationship is so good with the women's is, is Vic Akers. He is the men's kit man or equipment manager, whatever you want to call it. Um, he played as a professional soccer player uh, for a long time and he managed the women's team for over 26 years. So that link has always been really strong and he obviously has access to, you know, the, he sits on the bench with the men's team every game, he's in the training room, he's in the training sessions with the men, he's in the changing rooms with the men prior to game. So he has loads of experience of that. So his relationship with the men's team has meant that the relationship's been so strong for so long. This is the model as it stands now. So Ivan Gazidis is actually the president of the ladies team and the chief executive for the men's club. Um, obviously has the books, is in charge of the finance for the men's team, which is sometimes a big debate. Um, but he's a massive supporter of, of the women's side. Then Vic Akers, who's general manager, and Claire Wheatley, who's sort of the business manager for the ladies team. And then below that, there are eight full-time members of staff and five of which are players. And that's a, a, a big part, uh, which you'll see in a minute, as to why the model of Arsenal has been used, especially within Europe, um, to build women's, women's soccer. So in 2011, within England, the FA decided to change the top flight of the league to a summer league, whereas you know, traditionally in England, the season is August through to, to May. Um, they wanted to change it so that it didn't have to compete on a weekly basis with the men's game. So they changed it from a normal season to a April through to October season um, to try and get a little bit more standalone fans who don't have to compete with the men's teams on a weekly basis. The FA invested £3.5 million into the league, which was spread over eight teams. Um, and the model for each team was actually based around Arsenal. So looking at employing players as members of staff within administrative roles um, and the building of each team within the new league, if you looked at the structure, it pretty much was Arsenal. So it just shows you how much dominance Arsenal has had over the years. The reason for that was they didn't want to have a dominant force continuing to happen, which Arsenal had been for so, so long. And obviously, from a, an Arsenal perspective, the question was, how do you stay at the top? Which, by this stage, was my job. So, in their first season in 2011, um, there was a massive break between the 2010 season and the 2011 season. Um, and knowing this and having to manage that was quite difficult. So, we had to change the habits of the players from... They only trained twice a week previously in the years gone by, but always been successful. So knowing that the league was probably going to be a more competitive league, training those habits into becoming three and four times a week sessions um, where we could get the group together a lot more and see them a lot more. Strength and conditioning became a big part of our weekly schedule um, and it became a little bit more of a professional environment. More professional staff, more professional equipment, Players were a lot more professional in how they trained. So hopefully then by the time the 2011 season came, 
we could continue to be the dominant force, which everyone didn't want us to be. Um, and it happened. Um, it happened through a lot of reasons, one being the players worked really hard um, and we managed to win the league, to win the FA Cup and win the Continental Cup, which is the equivalent of the League Cup. Um, and in that same season, we got to the Champions League semi-final, which I'll go into more detail in a minute. So the FA's vision of getting rid of a dominance force completely changed because Arsenal became as dominant, if not more dominant, than they'd been in previous years because the attitude at the club, the attitude within the players, the attitude within the staff was, if everyone wants to knock us off, we're more determined to make sure we stay there. And, and that was instilled within the players and the group of players that are there, the experiences that they had meant that they were able to push themselves on when times got tough. There was periods in that season where we were chasing all the time. We were second, third, fourth, fifth in the league and we had to keep chasing to make sure we could stay at the top for as long as we possibly could. And we managed to secure the league on the final day of the season. So although the trophies say we were dominant, the league was a little bit more competitive than it had been in, in previous years. So in terms of the whole league, the FA's vision had worked because it was definitely more competitive, but still the dominant force was, was Arsenal. And that was a big factor into why the players uh, believed in the fact that they could be that dominant force was because they changed their habits in 2010 to go, we want to make sure that we stay on top. So in 2012, which was the second season of the WSL, it was a similar story. Uh, we won the league again, undefeated this time. We didn't drop, we didn't lose a game. Um, we won the Continental Cup. And a big part to why we were successful again in that year was the w WPS in this country folded. So we were able to get back probably three of the better players in the country in Kelly Smith, Alex Scott and Gemma Davison, who, to add to the squad that we had in the previous year that had been so done so well, to add their little bit of quality and experience meant we could push on again and succeed. The one game we lost uh, was in the FA Cup semi-final and in out of all the games, if you were going to lose one, it was the one that you didn't want to lose. And the reaction of the players after the game was they weren't going to let that happen again. And that happened in the April and we went all the way through to the December without dropping a game. Without, I think we dropped one point in that whole period. So... It, the players, again, their mentality was to keep going and keep pushing. And as staff, we just had to keep pushing them in the right direction. So a major issue in Europe, whether it be men's football or women's football, is the Champions League. So your domestic successes mean that you qualify for the Champions League. And anyone who watches soccer in the, the EPL sees that the difference between that and the Champions League is massive. And it's the same in women's football. You know, the, the standard is so much higher. Um, and in 2008, they made it from a UEFA Cup competition for women into a Champions League format. The top two teams from England qualify, and Arsenal have qualified for however long Europe's been going. But in the 2007 season, Arsenal actually won the Champions. It won the UEFA Cup as it stood then, and then they changed the structure. So that was prior to me getting to the club. So obviously that's something that constantly is in the background of what we wanted to try and achieve to get back to that final and win the win Europe again. The difference between UEFA Cup and Champions League was it was now a two-leg home and away fixture. You start in the round of 32. Um, so you might be travelling to Serbia, to Russia, to Belarus in the round of 32, but you've got to play away, bring them back home, and then whoever gets away goals, etc., all that type of stuff starts to count. Um, and the challenge for us as a group, so me as the manager, the players, was the expectation at Arsenal was you have to get to the quarterfinals as a minimum. That is a must, because it had been... I think at that stage it was nine seasons that they'd got to the quarterfinals without not getting there. So the expectation levels were really, really high. So 2009-10 season for the Champions League. My first ever game at Arsenal was actually the quarterfinal of the Champions League against Drewsburg away. Um, and having not had too much exposure of the Champions League, I didn't know how different it was going to be. But going to there, 
going to Germany, which is obviously a real dominant force in the women's game, um, playing in front of 6,000 people, which, again, in England you just don't get at the minute. Um, the standard was so much higher. And we came away from that game losing 1-0. Um, and then we lost at home 2-0. And at the end of that game, everyone sat on the field and said, right, it's 2010, April, if we want to be successful as a group, what have we got to do? We've got to train more. We've got to make sure training's competitive. The standard of play got to be high. Um, and it was a collective decision that we all wanted to go and push ultimately to be successful in our domestic season, but mainly to try and push through and get to that semi-final, final stage of Champions League. So that was a real big turning point in my managerial career at the club. So in 2010-11, um, we went to Spain and played Real Vallecano, lost away, brought them back home and won. I think it was a last minute goal, which was always nice. Um, Linköping away, which is a Swedish team. We drew away from home. We drew at home, sorry, and then drew away from home, but went through on away goals. And then Leon, who are by far the best team in Europe at the moment and have been for the last three years. We lost away 2-0. We, we conceded two goals in the first 10 minutes. And then we brought them back home and lost 2-1. But by far, they were the better team over two games and we deserved not to get to the final. So we played six games um, in this period in 2010 to 2011 um, and we wanted to try and make sure that we keep we tried to win that away game because we hadn't done it so far so into the next season with Champions League similar things starts to happen away games we drew all we drew or lost we bring them back home and we'd manage to just drag ourselves through again so we'd gone for three seasons now where we hadn't won an away game, but we continued to keep pushing and get into that, that last four. Um, the Frankfurt game there at home, we were drawing at home 1-1, um, and knowing that our away form was so poor, the moment they scored in the last minute, I, it was just devastating for, for me as a coach, because I knew how good Frankfurt were at home, and I knew <laughs> our traditional form was not the best away. So you go away and you're already your mentality is, we're not going to win this. So we had to work out a way of changing that habit. Um, and that brings us on to this season. So domestically, we'd been really good. We'd achieved, no one could beat us. And we knew that the league was ours. We messed up in the FA Cup, which was disappointing. But still the mentality was, we've got to try and do well in the Champions League. It's, it's what we pride ourselves on. So I happened to watch um, a documentary about Bradley Wiggins and the Team Sky um, preparing for the Tour de France and what they do when they go to hotels, how they prepare themselves, um, the th little bits of detail that they did to make sure that they were prepared for every day that they cycled. Um, and one thing was that they used to take their own duvets, take their own pillows, put pictures up around their rooms in their hotel rooms that were the same as what they were at home. Um, wherever they trained, where their training centres were, whenever they were warming up, they could see those types of things. So I started to think about what we could do and we didn't have the budget that Team Sky had. So we thought of things that we could make away fixtures home from home. Um, the, way that we, the way that we dressed the locker rooms, the way that we prepared out on the pitch prior to games. The fact that we didn't train when we went away from home in Champions League, we trained at home because it was what we were used to and it was what we were good at. And when we trained away, we didn't win. So let's try and train at home and see if it changes. Um, and the, we didn't speak to the players about why we were doing it, we just did it. Um, we started to gradually put photos up on the wall of things that were relevant to what our home changing room looked like. The home changing room had sayings across the top of the walls and we put them up in the change room. Again, didn't speak to the players about it, didn't tell them why, um, but just gradually saw a little change in the way that they thought. So we go to Barcelona, away, and we win. And I hadn't spoken to the players at all about our record away from home, but I knew that they knew about it, but we hadn't made a big deal. Um, so when we won away, 
I actually said to them, this is the first time you've won an away game in Europe for nine games, and they couldn't believe it. Because naturally, as a group, they're always successful and they always win. And we'd always got through each round, bar the semi-finals, and just not got to that next stage. So you could see their mentality really change of, oh, we've done it, we've won, great. So we'd take them back home, we beat them at home comfortably, um, and that prepared us for Potsdam. Um, the results there, and but there's a bigger story behind it. So it meant that in this season now, that we've just, in November, we changed a habit. We'd gone from losing away, winning at home, but when it came against the big teams, which Potsdam definitely is, um, we, it was never enough. So you had to make sure that you could achieve away from home. So a tactical question was asked when we came up against Potsdam. Um, I'd watched Potsdam numerous times on video, um, and they played 3-4-3. Three, three, and they set their three up like this. stayed high so we play 4-3-3 don't really change for anybody we're Arsenal why should we change um, and in previous years against the Leons and the Frankfurt it had probably cost us so I watched them over probably five or six games to think they're Potsdam Potsdam are German champions they've reached the last two Champions League finals Arsenal or an English club had never ever beaten a German team. The media portrayed us as underdogs from day one and we had to try and change a mindset. So having watched them, it's hard to watch a game when you haven't seen them play live and compare them to the team that you had. So I did loads of research around Potsdam and found they didn't have one senior German international in their team. So the day before we went out to play them, um, I wrote it up on the on the board for the players. Within Arsenal, we've got over 800 senior international caps. They didn't have one German international cap. So straight away, our players went from thinking, oh, we're underdogs, to suddenly thinking, well, we should win this. And that massively changed our mentality. So it wasn't about them anymore, it was about us. So with that mentality now, when I turned around to the players and went, right, we're going to play four at the back against that three, we're going to go with a midfield three against their four, and we're going to go with a front three against their three. They believed in it a little bit more than they had done maybe the week before. So we went with width and height on both sides. This player was Kelly Smith. Now, if you've never seen Kelly Smith play, she's probably outside of, outside of America, the best player in the world for me. Marta gets a lot of plaudits, but watching her live is like watching a, he's watching a male play, and I'm not sexist, but it's like watching, she could easily go and play in the male game. She's that good. And they, I knew they knew that. So I said, I, I had an inkling that they would try and man marker. So when we were training for this, these players kept saying to me, it's too easy too easy, they won't do that, they won't set up like that, they'll change, they'll change. I'd watched Potsdam play Lyon, Frankfurt, all the top teams in Europe and they'd never changed. But what, what tended to happen was, teams changed for them, so they either went with two up front, with a flat four and a four, or they went one, dropped their wide players in and picked up and went five versus four. Well because I thought, we have bags of pace in the wide areas and players who can really cause people problems. I said, okay, we normally play with a number 10 here. We drop the 10 back to go split across these four. And we said, if the ball was on this side of the field, then the midfield would shuffle across and leave this player. 
knowing that our back four have to take care of their front three. When we had the ball, we said to Kelly, wherever the ball is, run in the opposite direction because the man marker will follow you. And literally, for the whole game in the first half, this player man marked her, this girl sweeped behind, and wherever she went, she followed. So this player just had unbelievable amounts of space. But in training prior to it, the girls just didn't think that it would happen. And within 20 minutes of the home game, our girls realised, we can win this. We can win it, and we should win it. These were probably the most um, valued players within the system that we played in that game, because they had to do the most amount of work when we didn't have the ball. And the players, two of the players especially, are really good on the ball, and they didn't get to, they didn't get to show that too much because of the work they had to do without it. But these three completely excelled. Um, by half time, the girls are coming into the changing room saying, it's working, it's working, we can beat them, we can beat them. The mentality had completely changed. And so in the home game, we ended up um, scoring two goals and going 2 nil up. And we should have scored four or five goals quite easily. And then within the last kick of the game, Potsdam scored to make it 2-1, which was an away goal. So if they won one nil away from home at, at their ground, we were out, having been the complete dominant team. So we had a week's decision to make of, do we stick with it and go for it again? Or do we sit in and hope that we don't concede and we go through with a 2-1? Well, we're Arsenal, so we went for it. Within 20 minutes, we were 2-0 up. So now it's 4-1. And we, they just can't deal with us. And again, they did not change. They stayed three at the back. They stayed with their four and stayed with their three. So at half-time, it was 4-1 to us. And the girls are sitting there, and I can see that they're thinking it's game over, we've won it, it's over and I said to them they will go for it now they'll probably play one at the back, two at the back because they've, they've, they've got nothing to lose and Potsdam going out at the, at the round of 16 stage, which it was, has never been heard of, they've never been knocked out at that stage before so come out at half time by the 47th minute we were, it was 2-2 so I'm quickly trying to make a change to go with, um, to take off one of the wider players, the, one of the forwards, and go with a player who sits in front of the back four to just try and stop the threat. Because pretty much now, their shape is two at the back, one at the back, they're just going for it. So we're trying to get this player on and we can't get a run. We then go 3-2 down. So I'm looking at my dad because he remembers this game like it was yesterday. We go three two down and we're still now trying to make sure we're still we're still going through but on the way goals but any of the goals and I'm literally saying to my assistant what does this mean what's it like are we through are we not that it was just mental so we happen to score four with it goes to three all so we're okay we're it's constant threat from them it's just long ball long ball long ball but any goal by them and they were through any goal and we're like oh this is just horrendous our goalkeeper was exceptional and for the last 20 minutes Arsenal is a football club men or women are the same you play through the third you keep the ball you've got to make sure you play nothing else is acceptable for the last 20 minutes our goalkeeper got it and kicked it to her that was it she got it she kicked it to her and she kept it she got it she kicked it to her and we kept it and if she couldn't keep it, she'd play it into there and we'd start again. And then in the 82nd minute, we scored to make it 4-3. So by that stage, they had to score three goals to go through. And at the end of the game, um, we've obviously gone through and it's like a major, major change in English women's football to beat a German team. And their manager in the press conference afterwards was getting a real torrid time from the media it's a disgrace that Potsdam have lost. How can that be acceptable? And his reply was, if anyone thinks that this is a downside to Potsdam, they know nothing about football. Because in fairness to our players, and I'll definitely single out Kelly and, and our goalkeeper, they were superb in terms of just putting a game plan together. And without that, 
without that tactical going for it, we wouldn't have beaten them. If we'd have sit in and brought those in and just hope for the best, over two legs we wouldn't have beaten them. They'd have had too much for us. But the fact that we went for it and tactically we were better than they were, that meant that we could create history. Now, for me, that was my last game with Arsenal. So it's one that I'll always look back on <coughs> with, fond mem with fond memories. But the reason behind that and the reason why in four years we've been so successful as a group is I can't take all the credit. The players, without doubt, have a winning mentality. Um, but the one thing I found when I went to the club was they, win, they, they could win and they didn't know why they won. They just did it. So if you ask them tactical questions, how do you defend, what shape do you play, what shape do the opposition play, they had no idea. They literally went on a Sunday, trained really hard in the week, weren't coached, just trained, went out on a Sunday, played, and were successful from it. The more the game developed, they started to realise that they needed a little bit more work they needed to be coached. They needed to learn the game a little bit more. And that was probably the biggest surprise to me. Those players, 800 odd caps for their countries between them. E X amount of trophies. Probably Some of them have probably won half those 40 easily. And uh, <coughs> they, they didn't know why they did it. They didn't understand the game. They didn't understand why they were successful. They just were. And it sort of throws coaching on its head a little bit because... They had been successful for so long because they were the best players. It wasn't because they were coached. It wasn't because of what they knew or didn't know. They won because they were the best. And that was something when I went in there and started to coach, they were quite receptive to it, which I was quite surprised at because I went in there, you know, the best players in the country, the biggest names in the country, thinking they're going to know everything. And in reality, they didn't know a lot. So their experiences of winning trophies meant they had a winning mentality. But how they did it and why they did it, they didn't understand why. So that, as a coach, was a real learning curve because even at, some of them were 28, 29 when I first started coaching them. Older than me, in fact, when I first started co coaching them. Teaching them the game was something that they wanted. Even at that age, they wanted to learn, they wanted to be better because they were winners and they didn't want to lose that title of being the best. So they knew people were catching them up and they knew that they needed that little bit of help and support, which, thankfully, we were able to do. So, Potsdam will always uh, live long in my memory, and they actually now play in the quarterfinals against an Italian team called Torres in the middle of March. So, um, I, think, I think I left at the right time, but I will definitely be supporting them if they can try and go that one step further and get to the final. Thank you very much.